Well, this is part 14 in our, thank you, in our uh, sanctification series. Uh, This morning we are continuing in our discussion of the role of faith in sanctification. What role faith plays in sanctification? Really, this element of faith is what distinguishes a true biblical sanctification from all other means of change, from your positive thinking or pagan meditation practices or behavior modification, uh, because this element of faith really does highlight what only God can do. This is the only means of change produced by God. And so it is therefore divine. Uh, Oftentimes when I am, uh, when I have the opportunity to witness to cult members, uh, people that come to my door or that I encounter in other places, the, the two areas that I like to emphasize are Who is Jesus and whom does he save? Who is Jesus and whom does he save? The the nature of Christ and the nature of salvation are really the two areas of of doctrine that no other uh, belief system embraces about Christ, about genuine Christianity. You think of a system like Catholicism or Mormonism or Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, they're going to err on one or both of those two points of doctrine. And what I like to do is answer the door or use their Bible and say, can I, you mind if I borrow that for a second? And I will turn in their Bible to easily understandable passages that will demonstrate to them either who Christ is, that Christ is indeed God and man, and that salvation occurs on the basis of faith alone. And these things can both easily be proven from the Old Testament. So that even if they reject the truth that I put forward, they have to take that book back home knowing he was reading from what I'm taking home with me. And so hopefully in that way, God can use uh, the testimony from their own scriptures, which are perverted in various ways. He can still use what they've gotten right in those books to perhaps win them. One place I want you to turn to your, in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 15. One place where this is easily discerned, the nature of salvation, is here in Genesis 15. Because you might take issue with a lot of biblical characters. People have found fault in Paul and the gospel that he preached. People can find fault in other apostles, imperfect men. But one character in scripture with whom really you cannot find fault with his faith is the patriarch Abraham. He is indeed the father of faith. And so what we learn about faith from Abraham holds true for everyone who professes Christ. Anyone who claims to believe the Bible embraces Abraham. And so what's recorded for us by Moses in Genesis 15, 6 demonstrates really what the the core of faith is. How is someone reconciled to God or declared righteous by him. That's Genesis 15, six. Look at what that says. Then he believed Yahweh. He believed in the Lord and he, that is Yahweh reckoned it to him as righteousness. God counted Abraham's belief, Abraham's trust or faith in God as righteousness to him. And the way this conversation often goes when I, when I get to have it is I will just ask the person, how can I be made right with God? 
I'm a sinner. I'm well aware of that. What do I have to do so that God looks at me and instead of saying unrighteous, he says, no, righteous. Just tell me what I have to do. Similar to Acts 16, the the Roman jailer, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And your answer to that question is going to demonstrate what your faith is in. Is it in God or is it in self? Is it in God's righteousness on your behalf or is it in your own man-made righteousness? And here we get such a clear statement. This is after God has called Abraham out of Ur, sent him to a new land, the promised land. So he's already, in some sense, obeyed what God has required him to do, even has interacted with God a number of times since then, and has heard from God. But it's not until Genesis 15, 6, when the statement is written that he believed what God had just said to him, and God reckoned that belief as righteousness unto Abraham. So everything that comes after Genesis 15, 6 is not a statement about salvation for Abraham. Do you understand that? Here, Abraham is clearly identified as one who believes God and before whom he is considered righteous before before God. So everything that follows, all of the subsequent acts of faith, if you will, are not faith unto salvation, but this would be faith having to do more with sanctification and not salvation. This was a done deed before God. He was a justified man before God. God viewed him or considered him, reckoned him righteous based on his faith that he had exercised at this moment. And so when we see other acts of faith or faithfulness from Abraham, these are having less to do with him being saved, being converted, but more to do with a progressive walk before the Lord. And so now just turn with me to Genesis chapter 22, and we'll see an instance of Faith exercised in sanctification from the father of faith, Abraham. This is faith at work in sanctification. But we should not misconstrue that this is still saving faith. It's not a different kind of faith, as we'll see. The faith that saved Abraham was a belief in what God had said. The faith that sanctifies Abraham is going to be the same thing, a belief in what God has said. And we'll discover the implications for us, because if we understand this key principle for sanctification, then we also won't separate those two things. The same faith that you exercised at salvation must continually be exercised in sanctification on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour, moment-by-moment basis if you would be increasingly conformed to Christ's likeness. And so in Genesis 22, verses 1 through 19, what we'll see is four evidences of saving faith at work in sanctification. Four evidences of saving faith at work in sanctification. Sanctification. That is what is revealed in the first 19 verses of Genesis 22. This is a famous text. You probably have read this numerous times. Uh, You children in NGM have probably heard this taught in NGM numerous times. This is the instance when Isaac is sacrificed or almost sacrificed to God by his father, Abraham. Look at verse one, and we'll see these four evidences of saving faith at work in sanctification unfold themselves. Verse one, now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham 
and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. These first four verses reveal the first evidence of saving faith at work in sanctification, and it is this thorough obedience. The first evidence of saving work, saving faith at work in sanctification is thorough obedience. Abraham is putting thorough obedience on display for us. Several qualities characterize this thorough obedience. The first thing is readiness, a readiness to obey. Verse one, it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said, Abraham, and he said, here I am. This is not just a statement about, hey, God, you're looking for me. Oh, look no further. I'm over here. Geographically, I'm at this location. That's not what he's saying. When God calls to Abraham, he already knows where he is, but he calls for his attention. And if you notice here, Abraham responds with a readiness. Here I am. What do you have for me, God? You're speaking. I am at attention and prepared to do whatever you have for me in this moment. The thorough obedience is characterized by readiness. Uh, Secondly, verse two, it's characterized by attentiveness, attentiveness. This obedience is attentive. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Just notice the, the length of, of what God says. He doesn't give him just a simple command, but there's lots of details accompanying the command. It's almost like you would think Abraham doesn't know who he's talking about. Take your son your only son, the only son whom you love, his name's Isaac. You know him? Why all the details? None of them are are by accident. God doesn't waste words. But this is an emphasis on the one whom he's talking about and who is about to be put to death. Beneficial for not only Abraham, but the readers like us. He's his son, his only son, who's not actually his only son. You remember Ishmael, right? But this is, this is the only son that counts because he's the recipient, of, the recipient of the promises. So he's the only son in that sense. He's the beloved one. He goes on to say, whom you love. There's a special love for Isaac because he came in Abraham's old age and he was the son of promise from Sarah, who was barren and his name is Isaac associated with laughter. So your son, your only son, whom you love Isaac and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you, there's a specific land, a specific mountain, and a specific procedure, considering the offering, that all apply to Isaac. He needs to be brought to this land, to this mountain, offered there in this way, and don't worry, I'm going to tell you. So Abraham is a ready man, and as God unfolds the details. You don't see any interruption. There's no protest here from Abraham. He just listens. He's attentive. 
And how do you do in your obedience when God speaks? Are you attentive? Do you listen? Are you ready to obey? Is that your heart posture? Whenever God's words opened up, it ought to be. Also notice from verse two, that God is the one giving the commands. You take Isaac and you go to the land of Moriah and you offer him. There is a burnt offering of which I will tell you the instructions, the authority is one way. It's one directional. And so Abraham is a man in submission, postured perfectly to obey God. Abraham's not giving the commands. He's not making emendations to the instructions. He doesn't get to do what he wants to with God's words and make them mean something other than what they mean. No, he is in complete submission. He's a man under authority who is sim- whose only job is simply to do what he's told. But notice also in verse three, fourthly, he's eager. This thorough obedience is characterized by readiness, attentiveness, submissiveness, and eagerness. So Abraham rose early in the morning. Don't you love that? Without delay, as soon as he could, he is up and ready to go do this hard thing that God has tasked him to do. You would think that it was something easy for Abraham to do with the kind of zeal and eagerness that he goes after obedience. Certainly, this would have been the most difficult thing for him to do at this point. This is why it can be called in verse one, a test. If it's easy, it's not so much a test, but if it's a trial, then it's something difficult. And that's the idea. Even this difficult thing, he is eager to obey. And so what does he do? He gets up early in the morning. Do you get up early in the morning? All right, God, ready to obey. Let's go. His faith is being put on display here. Fifthly, This thorough obedience is characterized by diligence. So it is a diligent obedience. Look at all of the things that Abraham does. Just observe all the action words in verse three alone. Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split wood from the, for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. That's a lot of activity early in the morning. So he is being diligent. He is applying himself, whatever it takes to go and obey God at this faraway place. I'm ready for the instructions. I'm attentive in my obedience. I'm submissive completely. I'm eager to obey what you said, and even the diligence that it requires to get all the way to obedience, he's getting it done. All of this activity, it does not burden Abraham when this kind of activity is required for obedience. But finally, this is an enduring obedience. The thoroughness of his obedience is also enduring Because he doesn't just do these things and then turn around, make an altar and sacrifice Isaac, does he? How long did it take after he had done these things to then go complete the obedient act? Verse four tells us on the third day, he had three days to change his mind, alter his course, protest what God had said. And we see none of that. Just the very next thing he does or that we read is, okay, three days later, he sees the place. And so this is an enduring or thorough obedience. So whether it was three years, three days, three years, 300 years, this quality would have been the same. This is an enduring, enduring obedience. Even with the lapse of time, he doesn't waver. 
And so that does characterize a thorough obedience. When you are obedient, Christian, when you're at your best, then these things also characterize your obedience. You are most ready, attentive, submissive, eager, diligent, and steadfast or enduring in your obedience. That's your disposition before the Lord when you most believe him. This is the saving faith of Abraham at work in his sanctification. The second evidence of saving faith at work in Abraham and sanctification is secondly, inexplicable confidence, inexplicable confidence. Look at verse five. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go over there and we will worship and return to you. The inexplicable, unexplainable, something otherworldly confidence that he had is on display in that sentence, in that statement, primarily in resurrection by God. This is unexplainable confidence in resurrection that only God can accomplish. Look again at verse five. He tells his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad that's Isaac will go over there. And we, I and the lad that's Isaac will do two things. We will worship and what? What does it say? Return. What? You're both going to go do something and then come back together. What's Abraham counting on then? If in his mind, Isaac is a dead man. He is as good as dead. Then clearly Abraham thinking that we'll both return. He's counting on Isaac as surely as they're going to go over there together and worship together, return together. And he knows this has to happen because God has given the promises to Isaac. Notice Abraham, what, what does he not do? He doesn't spiritualize the promise. Oh, you know what? God said it was going to be Isaac, but if Isaac's going to die, then there's got to be some other way. He, he must have not meant literally, he must have meant figuratively or spiritually, allegorically, Isaac was going to be the heir of the promises. No, he doesn't change God's meaning from what God meant years ago when he made the promise. And we'll look at some of these in a minute. Genesis 12, 13, 15, 17, ensuring him your seed, you're going to have a seed. And it's not these other, these other sons, it's not Ishmael, it's not Eleazar in your household who's going to inherit it. Nope, I'm going to give you a child by Sarah, and here he is, and I want you to go kill him. That does not change the literalness of the promises. And Abraham knows that. And so the only solution, if in Abraham's mind, Isaac is as good as dead, is, well... He's going to have to bring him back to life, thus fulfilling the promises. And so really what's on display uh, most, I think, in Abraham's uh, faith, the particular content of the promises, uh, what his expectation, rather, that's on display, is confident in, confidence in God's ability to resurrect Isaac. But then also, verse, if we look at verses 6 through 8, Notice what else he's confident in. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Isaac's apparently done this before. His dad's taught him to worship. Because he knows what's missing. You've got a knife, you've got fire, we've got wood. Where's the animal to be sacrificed? And Abraham's response demonstrates another confidence. 
that cannot be explained by merely earthly means. Verse eight, Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Abraham's inexplicable confidence is in resurrection by God and in provision from God. And he doesn't unfold all these details to Isaac. He doesn't say, well, actually, son, you are the sacrifice. It's not time for him to know that yet, apparently. He just simply says, God will provide the lamb. And that's the only answer that Isaac needs. You don't see any protest from Isaac either. I don't think this story is primarily about Isaac's faith, but it does seem to indicate that he at least trusts his dad. Faithful children in obedience to God do entrust themselves to their parents' oversight. But this is an inexplicable confidence. Is your confidence in what God has, has said unexplainable by earthly means, by man-made wisdom? Can someone who does not believe the gospel hear your articulation of why you believe God and they go, oh, that makes sense. That is not an indication of saving faith. Even if you explain to them why you pursue sanctification or personal change the way you do, if the unbeliever hears how you accomplish change in your life and go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. It's not sanctification by faith. The, the faith that sanctifies as well as the faith that saves cannot be explained by earthly means. And no unbeliever believes what God has said. They don't understand what God has said. According to first Corinthians two, the natural man cannot understand the things of God because they're spiritually explained. They're spiritual things. And so the same applies to our sanctification. This cannot be explained merely in earthly terms by earthly wisdom. And so here, this is on display from Abraham. He's counting on things that are not reasonable, things that don't have any earthly basis in them to believe, things like a resurrection and provision from God opposite sight or against sight. There is no lamb. There is nothing else to sacrifice but he's confident that God will provide for himself what he, what he desires. This is a, a little bit of an aside to this whole passage. You just noticed in verses three and in verse five, who Abraham took with him. Who does it say he took with him? Two of his what? Young men, two of his young men. And then he tells those young men, maybe, perhaps, uh, Isaac's age or not much older than him. Why does he take two young men? Why not one? Seems that they have what they need. They can get up the mountain with just Abraham and Isaac. I don't know if this is was in Abraham's mind, but it is interesting to think about what in the world are these young men thinking? What are they thinking as they travel three days, watch Abraham pack everything up after receiving a word from the Lord that was authoritative, powerful, clear, sufficient. Were they asking questions about what in the world are we doing? Where are we going? all of Abraham's answers to those questions would have had to do with, this is what God has said and we can trust him with what we're about to do. These two young men, these two young servants would have 
been watching as they traveled to Mount Moriah and especially as they went back to the land of the Philistines, they would have been learning and they would have gotten a a vivid picture of what faith on display looks like. You think this would have stuck in their minds the rest of their lives? We don't know what happened to them, but they had an undeniable example in Abraham of what it looks like to walk faithfully and trustingly with the Lord. I like to think that Abraham is in some sense, discipling these young men and just teaching them, bringing them along as he faithfully obeys the Lord. And that's another good example for us. You Christian faithfully obey the Lord, faithfully pursue him, believe what he has said, and then walk in a way that is in keeping with what you know to be true and bring others along as God works that faith in you, in your sanctification. Moving on in our passage, number three, the third evidence of saving faith at work in sanctification is seen in verses nine through 14. Let's read that verse nine. Then they came to the place of which God had told him and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son, Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of Yahweh called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, this is again, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked and behold, Behind him, a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place. The Lord Yahweh will provide as it is said to this day in the Mount of Yahweh, it will be provided. This third evidence of saving faith at work in sanctification is Abraham's reverential worship, reverential worship. Notice that Abraham follows through on what he's told to do as far as he possibly can until God himself stops him from doing so. In verse five, he said, we will worship. And then in verse verses nine through 14 that we just read, he does that very thing, but he doesn't sacrifice his son. He sacrifices an animal instead. And this is an act of worship. Whenever you see those uh, things happening in scripture, sacrifices being made, offerings being given. This is worship language. This is an act of worship consistently throughout scripture. And so he follows through on, on worshiping God, but not in the way that he intended in sacrificing Isaac. This reverential worship, notice in verse 12, what the angel of Yahweh calls it. He says, I know that you fear God. What he was doing was an act of fearing God. This was a demonstration of a fear of God in Abraham. And even that word fear is a worship word. To fear God, to know God, to love God, to obey God, to worship God. All of these are essentially synonymous terms. Abraham's reverential worship is seen not only in the animal offered, but also in the name given to this place. Verse 14 says that Abraham names the place or calls that place. Yahweh will provide. This is where the, the 
more common term Jehovah Jireh comes from. That's taken from Yahweh will provide in the Hebrew. As it is said today, to this day, in the Mount of Yahweh, it will be provided. This mountain, just to connect some, uh, some dots throughout progressive revelation for you, this Mount Moriah, even in Moses' day, as you see written in verse 14, was still called Yahweh will provide. <clears throat> and if we were to fast forward several hundred years to David's day, this is where David or the angel of Yahweh ceased slaying uh, the people of Israel when he brought about that plague because of David's sin of numbering the people. And this is where David consecrates uh, that place. He offers an offering there. David does very similar to what Abraham does. This is the same mountain. And this is later where Christ would oft ultimately be offered as well. This same, uh, or, or rather near, near this place is where Christ was offered, but where the, uh, the temple would be built. Mount Moriah. This is the, the same place. Abraham's offering, David's offering, Solomon's building of the temple is the same site. And so it was appropriately called Yahweh will provide. This act of worship accomplished by Abraham became the same location of Israel's worship. And really, most importantly, the uh, similar location is where, where Christ was ultimately crucified, where God provided uh, an ultimate sacrifice for our sins. This is how this fits together biblically. And then finally, this fourth evidence is a pertinent promise or pertinent promises. So these four evidences, thorough obedience, inexplicable confidence, thirdly, reverential worship, and pertinent promises. Just notice in 15, and we'll come back to this angel of Yahweh, but just notice how the angel of Yahweh finishes this account. Then the angel of Yahweh called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself, I have sworn, declares Yahweh, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand, which is on the seashore and your seed shall possess the gate of literally his enemies. That's a singular there, not their enemies, but his enemies. Verse 18, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba and Abraham lived at Beersheba. Two times the angel of Yahweh says why Abraham is going to become the heir of these promises or why these promises will be fulfilled through him specifically. That's what makes them pertinent. They're uh, personally applicable to Abraham. These are not unrelated or detached from Abraham or from his obedience. And so they're pertinent in that way. Verse 16, he says this because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. And then again, in verse 18, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So the reason given as to why Abraham would inherit these promises, why the promises would come through Abraham is because of Abraham's obedience. In other words, his faith was on such display that God could say that obedience that proves your saving faith that's why you're going to inherit these promises. That it's so evident that you believe God in your obedience. Your, the evidence is clearly on display. This is why these things will come about. And these promises were made already to Abraham. 
God had already promised him these things. This isn't the first time that Abraham is hearing promises of blessings and a seed and the nations being blessed through him. Just flip back to Genesis 12. This is when Abraham is initially called. Verse one. Now Yahweh said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land, which I will show you and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So he starts any conversation about Abraham receiving these promises to be a blessing here when he initially calls him out of Ur of the Chaldeans. When Abraham and Lot separate, just flip over one chapter to verse 14, Genesis 13, 14. After he and Lot separate and Lot takes really good land in Canaan and Abraham willingly, gladly takes what, I, what Lot doesn't pick. Then Yahweh says to him in verse 14, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are northward and southward and eastward and westward for all the land, which you see, I will give to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. So then Abraham started moving his tent. He moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And there he built an altar to Yahweh. So again, further detail given to what God intends to do for Abraham. He doesn't have any children still years later, flip over to chapter 15. Even after he goes to war, verse 15 says these, after these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abraham, Abram said, O Lord Yahweh, what will you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of Yahweh came to him, saying, This man will be your heir, will not, excuse me, this man will not be your heir but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars. If you are able to count them. And he said, so shall your descendants be. Then the verse that we read, then he believed in Yahweh and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. This promise to not make Eleazar his heir, but one who came from his own body, even in his old age, even in Sarah's old age, he would be the one to inherit the promises. He would be the heir. And he would so multiply his descendants that just like the stars he was looking at in the pitch black of night, they would not be able to be numbered. When Abraham believed that God counted it to him as righteousness, in an act of incredible unbelief in chapter 16, he impregnates Hagar. But this does not stop what God has promised to him. Cause in chapter 17, we encounter a 99 year old man in Abram and look at what the promises remain to be. Verse one, Yahweh appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God almighty walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, 
As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Can you imagine Abraham going from nation to nation in the land of Canaan as he's sojourning and introducing himself to people as, hello, my name is a multitude of nations. This is my wife, Sarah. And they're looking behind the man with no children. A father, a father of nations. That's your name. Well, yeah, see, God has told me that I'm going to have the seed. And even though my wife's really old, this is what God has said. And so that's what's going to happen. And if you believe that, then you and your nation can be blessed. Right. Maybe the introduction went something like that. God insists in verse six, I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. If you haven't been coming to night services, this is coming up soon in Zephaniah. A continual adherence from God to these specific words, to these promises that Abraham and his descendants will get this land. God has not let go of his promises. Isaac's finally born. Uh, Soon after this, 18, the promise is given again from God in human flesh, by the way. I talked about some of those passages that I like to take uh, cult members to who don't believe that Jesus is God. And Genesis 18 is prime real estate to see that because God is clearly a man recognizable by Abraham, by the way. He doesn't need an introduction, just knows who he is. And so on and on, you get a short period of time between chapter 18 and then chapter 21 when Isaac, Isaac is finally born. But then you see God's insistence on bringing about these promises uh, to Abraham, his obedient servant. He can ensure Abraham that these promises will belong to him. He already knows that Abraham has saving faith, according to Genesis 15 that we've already seen. And the evidence being put on display, the angel of Yahweh says that this is knowledge to him. Experientially, in the timeline of human history, Abraham's fear of God, his faith in God has been so demonstrated that God himself says, it's clear. I know these things. Uh, by experience. And let me just take you for a second back to uh, verse nine in, in Genesis 22. Excuse me, verse 11. Just notice who's talking to him. The angel of Yahweh. He's calling to him from heaven, the angel of Yahweh. And what does the angel of Yahweh say? He says in verse 12, I know that you fear God because or since you have not withheld your only son from whom? Me, from the angel of Yahweh. This act of worship, offering up Isaac, was being done to the angel of Yahweh. When God told him in verse one to do this and offer up Isaac as a burnt offering. And we saw Abraham in complete submission to this God who was speaking. This God apparently is the same one as the same God as 
this angel of Yahweh, this messenger sent by God is God himself is the point. He receives worship. He is the one to be feared. And he is the one after whom the place is called Yahweh will provide. When the angel of Yahweh provided, it was appropriately called Yahweh will provide. These are incredible evidences of the faith that saves at work in sanctification. And these things are the same for us. The the faith that God worked in you, Christian, to save you, that became the means of him justifying you before himself, that same belief in God must continually be exercised, no longer for salvation. That's a one-time act. Praise God. We don't need to be resaved, justified again, reconciled again to God. That's a done deal. We are adopted by God once and for all as children and made heirs. But subsequent to that, the same kind of belief in God must continually be exercised in order for you to make any progress toward holiness is the point. And each time you do make progress toward holiness, genuine obedience is an exercise of the same faith in God. So just consider some implications from from this passage, just a few to fly through here. If this is true, that the same faith that saves you, Christian, must continually be exercised and at work in sanctification, then despise the unbelief that results in your disobedience. Despise the unbelief that results in disobedience. Learn to see it for what it is. Call it what it is. This is unbelief in God. I've already once and for all believed God by his grace and I am saved. And yet in the weakness of my flesh, there is lingering sin, indwelling sin that is rooted in unbelief. So every time I see sinful anger, lust, pride manifested in my life at the root of that is not believing what God has said. True is true about himself, about me, about the gospel, again, about that other person that I'm in conflict with something. I am believing a lie and that is allowing me to sin despise that unbelief and identify it for what it is. Also recall the unbelievable quote unquote, truth of the gospel. Just remember all the details of the gospel that completely defy reality, right? This is the inexplicable confidence that you Christian have in God when it comes to the gospel. Can you see Jesus having your sins imputed to him on the cross? You can't see that. You can't hold that. You can't taste that reality, but you believe it as if you could. You've staked your entire eternity on that reality that God imputed your sins before you were ever even born to Christ. All of your sins, past, present, and future were in a matter of hours imputed to Christ and God's furious wrath was exhausted on his sinless son on your behalf. And he survived that. Cause he died and rose again. You believe that. And there's absolutely no way you can prove that except that you know it to be true by faith. So just recall the unbelievable nature of truth uh, of that truth in the gospel. That has no reasonable explanation to it for why you believe it. And so if you have already believed that those unbelievable truths, those truths that defy any earthly explanation, then in your pursuit of godliness, you can thirdly confess the folly of entrusting your eternal soul to God, but not lesser things. Just think about, I've already believed what, com- what is completely unreasonable according to man's standards. That's the the most ultimate reality. I'm just believing God. 
So in lesser things like God's provision for a job, uh, my children's safety, uh, an uncertain economic climate, uh, uncertain elections, right? The future of our country and our state. I can trust God with those things, can't I? Is that more significant than my eternal destiny? If I, if I trust God with my eternal destiny, then certainly those lesser things I can trust him with. And just admit to God, this is foolish. When I am anxious for any of these things, but not anxious for my salvation, not anxious for my eternal destiny, what am I doing, God? I can trust you with these things. And then finally, fixate on faith in your pursuit of sanctification. The final takeaway, just first fixate on faith in your pursuit of sanctification. That is for yourself and others in your own life. As you pursue godliness and you, you're probably aware of some besetting sin in your life. Just go search out. What am I not believing that is true? That is why the truth is able to sanctify because you believe it. And God is using that confidence in what he has said to produce godliness in us. So fix it on faith. Make that your primary target. What you go after. What am I not believing? Oh, this chapter, this verse, this reality, this principle from scripture and prayerfully confess to God I must believe this. God, help me believe this. Help my unbelief. Make me have confidence in this reality that I find in scripture here. And so hide God's word in your heart so that you will stop sinning against him. All right. This is sanctification 101. And then as you draw near to others in the body, do the same for them. Where you hear wrong thinking, you go, wait, what are they not believing? Because that's not true, what they just articulated. Let me bring the truth to them and say, no, no, believe this instead. And in doing that, you'll be a competent disciple or of others. Where you can identify weaknesses, patterns of uh, flawed faith. And you can come alongside them as others have done for you and help them understand what God has said. And you can counsel them, disciple them, walk with them unto spiritual maturity. This is, this has to be commonplace for us, for our own lives. And as we walk with one another, let me pray. God, thank you so much for uh, such a, a testimony in Abraham that you clearly unfold what's at work in him uh, growing strong in faith. Help us to also grow strong in faith. Help us to draw near to the truth in Bible reading and prayer in our service in our discipleship um, relationship with others that we would constantly in all of those various activities be fixated on truth and the faith that we must exercise in believing you and God in your own mysterious, unexplainable way. We pray that you would use that to conform us to Christ likeness so that you would be glorified in the world and your image uh, would be rightly born in us as you are represented by the church in Tempe and abroad in the rest of the world. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.